Because <laughs> in Wisconsin, we don't get to r- drive our cars year round. You know, we have winter. How do you say that? Where, where? where? Wis- Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Okay. Wisconsin. 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 The only way. To- yeah. <laughs> the only way to say it. <laughs> hey guys, fastest pastor here. I am blessed and honored to have the infamous Reese Millen with us this morning. Tanner and I are joined with him. Reese, good morning. Morning, guys. How are you? I'm Doing good. Well. We're having fun this morning. Boy, I'll tell you what, Reese, you're a breath of fresh air this morning. I turned on the news this morning. We've seen nothing but riots and the ugly of humanity. And uh, one thing that's nice is you're the good of humanity. So I'm, I'm glad that you could join us. Uh, I want to dig in, Reese. Obviously, you are a man of many talents. I told my wife, I said, there's, there's two guys I would love to be. And one is Jeff Zwart, and the other one is Reese Millen because these guys have lived the life, have done some extraordinary things and continue to do so. And so Reese, um, let's just start from the beginning. You're from New Zealand originally. I am, yes. And you you came over here as a teenager, correct? I I did. My father moved here uh, in the late 70s. Um, He was rallying in New Zealand and was very successful winning four championships in a row. Uh, there was a team owner who was uh, a successful team owner, but uh, not a driver in the U.S. and invited my dad to come over and drive for him. And then he moved here in the late 70s. I stayed in New Zealand with my mum, and upon finishing high school, moved uh, to the U.S. in 1990 to go to college out here and, and, and work for my father. Oh, wow. And, and yeah, your dad has quite a pedigree. I mean, you come from a, a, a pedigreed family in the racing. He won several championships in New Zealand, in America. And he, another guy that wheeled a lot of different cars, right? And I think he did pro rally, won three championships, was it? Yeah, I think it was three in, in the U.S. as well. Yeah. Uh, and then the Asia Pacific championship. And yeah, he's, he's not too bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not too bad at all. And he's, he's done Pike's Peak several times. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so cars, you obviously love cars. I mean, you've had a lot of different cars. Did your love of cars come from your dad or was it just something like, no, nah, it's always been in me or not nah, kind of developed over time? Uh, I think it, it started and developed with love for speed. And, and for me in New Zealand, um, what was obtainable and, and what could I, I could afford was, um, bikes, mountain bikes. Um, my grandfather um, was quite influential in my younger years for cycling. And I started racing BMX bikes in New Zealand, uh, competing against Australia and New Zealand, finishing second in eight, nine year olds. Um, got burnt on it, went back into it later on and, and then progressed into mountain biking. And ultimately, between finishing school in New Zealand and, and mountain biking is what brought me to the US to, to be with my father. Um, at that point, really wasn't into cars, didn't own a car, uh, didn't get my license till I was 18, 18 and a half. What? Um, and, and I figured my entire life, I could just ride my bike. I was going to, to college in the morning, to dad shop and to home, and that was 35 miles round trip each day. And to me, that was just training for riding bikes, and I was happy. And then, uh, well, dad went out of town, once he was racing in Malaysia for two months and there was a car sitting in the garage and I found the keys and got into a little bit of trouble and there developed my passion for going fast um, and okay. had to put it into a controlled environment. All right. So I would have never guessed you. I thought for sure you were boring with a steering wheel in your hand and here no, 18 thought, years old. Yeah, I know. Crazy. Right. And, and, and now it's, it's still interesting. It's, um, you know, bikes has been a big credit for um, balance and feel of understanding the car. Um, and my background in art, which um, I've kind of implemented into my business, is, um, you know, developing and building and designing the cars. Um, so from livery designs to construction to uh, working with more talented people than, than I I have his abilities you know, to, to fabricate and, and machine, although my background is in machining for many years. Um, working alongside of those guys to develop the, the cool cars and the cool builds that I've then been able to uh, 
develop as a driver into successful winning cars. Okay, so I, I have to ask, I mean, obviously, man of many talents, and, and we'll talk more about your business because you do some really cool stuff out of, out of Reese Millen Racing over there. And, but tell us about the little bit of trouble you got taking dad's car for a joyride. I got, I got to hear this one. Yeah, it's actually a pretty good story because I thought I'd gotten away with it. Um, <laughs> and uh, so- Don't we all? Yeah. Dad, <laughs> dad's, racing, dad's racing in Malaysia, part of the Asian Pacific Rally Championship. Um, and he can watch this because he knows the story fully now. Although, uh, so he was gone for two months, um, and there was always the temptation of the cars, and I never had it. And then I was going with a whole bunch of friends out to like car hops, and and I'm like, man, I've got a car that could just smoke all of these cars sitting in the garage. So I went filing through the through the drawers in his room and found the keys and fired it up. I didn't, I didn't even have my license. And uh, went out street racing one night and smoked this turbo Volkswagen bug that was just set up for drag racing. And at the end of the corner was uh, was like a 90 degree left that went into a main, like three lanes each way. And I lost control, slid through this, slid through the intersection with oncoming traffic right up to the curb and stopped. And I'm like, I can't believe I'm alive. That was the stupidest thing I ever did. I am so lucky that the car is not damaged. Then I drove away and I'm like, man, it's making kind of like a bit, 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 bit noise. I'm like, well, it's fine. I'll put it in the garage, wipe it off. And dad comes home four to six weeks later and he takes the car out. Well, he knows the dig, dig, dig noise is flat spotted tires yep. down to <laughs> boards on the rear. And oh, he knows man. exactly what has happened. And he tells me, he tells me, well, here's a lesson for you. Those tires were specially ordered from Michelin for the size that they are. They're thousand dollars each and you're paying oh. for them. So thankfully I wasn't hurt. I never injured anyone else. Um, and when I was, what was it? 17, eight, 17. Then, um, I had a $4,000 bill and I was making, I think about nine bucks an hour. So that, that put a lot of, uh, how would you say I learning curve was very fast to respect yeah. other people's things and, and not take risks. Do you have any <laughs> other siblings by chance? I do. I have um, now a younger brother, um, half brother, 12 years younger than myself. And then another half brother at 20 years younger than myself. Okay. So at the time you wouldn't, you wouldn't have been able to pin it on them. Uh, no, no, I was, <laughs> yeah, I was responsible for this one. 100%. <laughs> Oh man, I love that story. That's awesome. You know, uh, I've, I've, my dad was a gearhead, never raced or anything, but he was a gearhead and a cop. Yeah. And so try, try having a dad that tells you all these stories about before he was a cop about drag racing, street racing, everything else. And then he's a law enforcement officer, police, chief of police actually, and tells you, you can't do anything stupid like what I did. And so I always had these, and I came from a poor family. Uh, so it was just, very limited, but I, I think I owned, what was it? I think it was 18 cars by the time I was 16. Okay. I loved, yeah. I loved cars. Um, yeah. and, and Tanner knows my first car was actually a Simca. <laughs> I didn't even know what that is. Um, it's probably <laughs> the ugliest car you've ever seen. A Simca? Actually, Who makes that? So I had two of them. It was Simca. It was a company that was kind of a sp spin off of, I think it was Fiat. And, okay. uh, it's a small little car. So I had, I had two of them. I had like a 36, I think it was. And the other one was like a, like a mid seventies, late sixties. And I liked that one because it wasn't in style back then. And, you know, in the late eighties, early nineties, I wanted to slam it way down and put fender flares on it, which yeah. now it would be cool. Everybody'd be doing that, but horribly designed engines. Um, they had <laughs> the radiator was behind the engine. If I remember right, <laughs> it was just like the worst design in the world. Yeah, um, yeah, ugly, ugly cars. But I bought, sold, traded, you know, and my parents couldn't support my habit. I had to support. Yeah, yeah, that's one of them I had. Mine was a two door though. Um, <laughs> but mine were actually brought over because both were mail carrier cars. They were prototypes for mail carrying cars. Oh, okay, sure. Yep, yep. I think they had like 20 horsepower. I did the same thing, the trading and buying and moving up, but with bikes. So, 
Okay, so you, you can relate. I, I, I understand the reasoning. Yep. But uh, yeah, so um, I got nabbed really hard by my dad one night. I passed him and my mom in the opposite direction. I think I was 13 years old while reaching for fourth gear at about 130 miles an hour. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 further on to my driving uh, performances on the street, I got a 103 ticket in a 35. <laughs> Yes, there's another. That actually was my last, you're an idiot, you need to stop this. And I was about 28 then. Um, oh. And I don't know how I got away with it, but uh, Dad knew the district DA, so maybe that had something to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one of those things, don't ask, don't tell, right? We just... No. It's, it's hard, though, as, as a, now that we're both older as a peer, you, you want to influence your children to have fun you want to give them guidance to make mature decisions but at the same time you can't prevent them from experimenting on their own mm -hmm. and you know it, that was a lot of head butting with my dad he would tell me to do something he would tell me or explain to me on how to do something and if i chose to do it differently he always got frustrated he's like why do i bother even trying to help you i'm like well if you tied my shoes for me every day how am i going to learn how to tie my shoes but if I tie my shoes, I might find a better way to tie my shoes. So, you know, you need to make mistakes. You need to go through experiences. And hopefully they're not that crazy enough that you could still live to tell them. Right, yeah. right. Not, not only that, but in, in the mind of an adolescent, you know, as soon as a parent says, don't do this, that's the exact that trigger. Yeah, that's, that's the uh, challenge accepted. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, yeah, so... Yeah, I would, I would agree. And, and that is hard as a parent, Reese, is that balance. You know, I was thinking I've, you know, I gave up street racing back in my high school years, right? And I, I gave that up and, and had a bad experience and just thought, you know, I'm going to get killed. Not so much racing, but collecting money. Uh, and so <laughs> I wasn't, I didn't know Jesus at the time. I was a different man back then. But, um, you know, it's ironic, like, one night we're coming home from youth group and I have a BMW that Ty from Ty speed, you know, from Pikes peak. I just told my, he had a BMW I saw for sale. I'm like, Hey, take that. I said, I just like an everyday drift car that if I see a corner that needs a black mark, I can put it in there. And uh, on the way home from youth group on the back country roads, you know, I live in the middle of the country. I'm drifting with, with my kids in the car and my son's digging it. And I look back and my daughter's as white as a sheet. <laughs> and I realize like I drift, you know, yeah. So I'm trying and I told him, like, you don't do this until you know it's safe. And you just try to teach them. And, and my kids are super responsible. So thank God for that. They're not idiots like I am. <laughs> but so Reese, you, you get into the car, you're hooked. Obviously that hooked you. I mean, you can say that night scared you, but obviously it hooked you. But you've had yeah. a, a really interesting career. I mean, you've done so much. Um, so from that moment on, where did you go? So, um, you know, you know, as you explained, for in today's model in motorsport is you have to have money. Um, you have to come from money. Uh, there is no go out and perform and earn a ride. Um, it is, it is, the business model has changed and it is technically all about marketing. Um, Thankfully, I was right on the cusp of still being able to have talent to, to earn sponsorship to be able to continue racing. Um, but that came with a, a longer duration of uh, proving yourself. So my natural uh, progression into motorsport was following what my dad was doing at the time was rallying. And, uh, you know, there was no social media. There was no way to go get a, a few thousand views or likes and, and get some support and free tires or any of that. You just, so I had his old, one of his old cars that I, um, was a donor car and I built the cage and built the suspension and had all the takeoff tires. And I did local rallies for a number of years. Um, and, and I did Pikes Peak actually as my fourth ever race um and my rookie year i was 19 in 1992 oh wow and uh, in, ended up winning the pikes peak open division by less than a second um so i've had like, you like those close wins 
three or four like really close wins. They're calling out the times at the top, and you did a, I think the time on dirt on a normally aspirated Mazda R at seven then was twelve minutes twenty nine seconds, and they go, "You're a twelve twenty nine, and he's a twelve twenty nine." And I'm like, "Really?" And I'm like, "And and point oh eight to you?" And I'm like, "Well, there ain't no way you beat that." So we we got the win on that, but um, it was yeah, it was a about eight years of uh, treating it as a hobby, motorsport, and focusing on my business, um, which is motorsport related, but that's where you make your money. Um, and focusing really of six of those years solely on Pikes Peak. It was an event that um, I could get some funding for. I could focus on putting all of my time and effort of, of what funding I had into that event. And rather than trying to do a full season and finishing 20th, 15th, 30th, DNFing, whatever. I just focused on making sure I was completely dialed and was going to win the, the race. Um, so did that for a number of years. And that exposure that I got from it, from magazines and TV, uh, at the time, I was able to, to turn into a full motorsport, motorsport factory program in 19... 99 with Mitsubishi uh, and continued rallying then as well. And you were what, 25 at that time? Yeah, I think it was yeah, about 20, 26. Yep. 26. Yeah. So, yep. you know, that would, and what's funny is nowadays people would be like, that's old, you know? Yeah. And, and right. because, but in all honesty, I mean, there's a guy that made it. And Reese, you're probably one of the last that made it on talent. You know, when you say you're on that cuss, I mean, that's, that's the truth. Yeah, and we were able to have, you know, jumping many steps, 16 years of um, support from Toyota, Nissan, Mitsubishi, General Motors, Pontiac brand, and then finished our run with, uh, well, Hyundai, and then the last couple of years with Bentley. So yeah. um, it, it's every aspect of the sport um, I've learned as a driver. Um, taking different techniques from one discipline of motorsport to another. Um, but really the foundation has always been building cars and working on cars and understanding the mechanics mm -hmm. has given me a good feeling of how to manipulate the driving of the car to get the car to perform at its maximum level. And sometimes that is just being patient and being slow to go fast. You know, it's funny you say that my crew chief, who's no longer with us, he passed away just a few weeks ago. He used to tell me, when you feel slow, you're fast. Yep, and I, have, I, I, have I hate that, that feeling. I hate that my crew chief many times, and I'm like, JR, this is so easy to drive. I just don't feel like I'm even going fast. And he'll pull out data card, and you'll be like, you just went the quickest you've ever gone. So <laughs> yeah. I know the future. And so, and, and I felt like, you know, obviously Andy building Bernice for me for the Pikes Peak, I told him, you know, I never knew how fast we were the whole time. I never looked at times. It was always just about improvement. I was afraid that if I ever looked at a time, I'd race over my head. You know, I, I, I don't, because I did it in the simulator, right? I'd start getting worried about time in the simulator and I'd end up crashing the simulator. And so I'm like, I'm just not going to do it. And I just remember like, I always would tell him, man, it just doesn't feel very fast. That's all I kept telling him. And he's like, you're getting better. And then there'd be sometimes, that felt really fast. He's like, eh, you might want to rethink the way you drove it. <laughs> and so. It, it, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah, it I, is. And I, at, when we were with um, Bentley the last, was it last year? Um, I can come up to speed pretty quick because of my background in rallying. Um, and I'm like, guys, I'm like one or two seconds away from maxing out. And then I'll, I'll hit my peak and I'll try to push harder and overdrive the car and end up going one or two seconds slower. So it's, it's definitely a fine balance between trying too hard and just being smooth. Yeah. Yeah. And, and <clears throat> for a guy like me, I mean, it's, it's kind of like this Reese last year when I got accepted, which I never thought would ever happen. Uh, my buddy Tim called me and he said, did you see the acceptance list? And he starts laughing. He's like, you're a nobody. <laughs> He's like, you're the only nobody on there. And I've never had a driving coach my whole life. And my, my circle track career, I, early on, I did shifter carts. I was actually really successful at that. I did really well. It was a series that only ran two years and went bankrupt. 
Um, the first race I ever ran, I came home with a $35,000 check that was bigger than my arms. Nice. And, but they were dangerous. Um, oh, you yeah. know, when we were at Daytona, it was 198 miles an hour. We were tucking into the corner. And uh, I think the only reason I won is I've just never, I've lacked fear. I, I, I feel like I know fear and I'm calculated. So maybe that's why I'm not fearful. But I never had a driving coach, right? And I, I used to think like, oh, I'm a great driver. I won these championships. Well, I learned the only reason I won the championships, I would drive in four cart lengths deeper than everybody else and just hope you're, the cart stuck. like a guy from Free Solo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Alex yeah. Hamild. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, you not, and, and, and I realized I'm not good. And, and so I had my first driving coach last year. Never had a driving coach in my, in my life. And we're in the car and he's telling me stuff. And he's like, well, you probably already know this. I'm like, nope, didn't know that. And he's like, well, what about, nope, didn't know that either. And he's like, look at me. He's like, and you're going to Pike's Peak? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I am. And, and luckily, I, I think I'm an okay student. But, and obviously, you know, Pike's Peak for me uh, was a different, a different venture. It was a bucket list. I honestly never thought I'd be here this year talking and able to do it again. When we did it last year, it was, let's hope I'm not so ill come Pike's Peak, I can't race. Right, and right. I really thought cancer, you know, we just, we didn't have a whole lot of hope for cancer at that, at that time. And, and then after Pike's Peak in August, I took a really turn back for the worst. And so to be here again, like I'm super excited. So I feel like I'm experiencing it all over again for the first time, uh, getting things ready and I'm getting antsy. But um, so obviously Pikes Peak did a lot for your career. And so let's talk about rally. I know Tanner's got some questions on rally and, yep. and I want to talk a little bit about your stunt driving because sure. uh, yeah, but let's first talk about the rally. Tanner had some questions, but you were, you did super well in rally and drift. And I heard, you know, Jeff Swart told me one time, he said, watch Reese Millen's lines because he said he can t make a slow car fast and he says and he and you know Jeff obviously coached me last year and and he's going to do it the first weekend and I'm hoping I still can sucker you to come up the second weekend uh to coach me um because I you know learning but you have he's right I mean there's some videos I've seen of you just I, I don't understand how you can get a car to do what it does and so you did some drifting, you, you did the rally, obviously they rely on each other a little bit, but tell us about that. Yeah. yeah. You know, in a, in a full circle of everything, um, you know, have, having limited fear as you do uh, enables you to go fast. It's probably better to have that ability to block or that mindset uh, than trying to coach someone to come back up to speed because once they get scared once, it's a hard reset and it's, you know, it's a full start over again. So rallying, um, I always had underpowered cars. It wasn't until later in my career that I had big horsepower cars. So momentum was very, very important and maximizing everything out of the tire, out of the braking zone, out of the corner speed, um, you know, to get a good lap or whatever was going on. Um, and it, taught me a lot to be smooth um, and racing Pike's Peak when it was dirt taught me a lot to be smooth and, and carry corner speed um, and and be very very delicate on on throttle um, I could haze a set of tires in five miles or I can make them last the entire run um, so there was still a foundation that goes back to racing Pike's Peak that developed my skill set for for rallying and, and for drift. Um, and then obviously we can talk later about the film world, but then the film world is an ability to perform the same maneuver over and over and over while the director and the director of photography change the lens, change the camera position um, and so forth. So if you're, if you're gonna be asked to slide through one corner you know, 20 times, 50 times, whatever, I'm not just going to go sit there and repeat it. I'm going to go sit there and, and try a little bit of a slightly different technique. If it's a handbrake technique or if it's you know, full power on or, or try to grip drive that slide and 
so that ability of, of both worlds um, developed my skill set. Um, and then again, the mechanical understanding of the cars when we started stepping into different sports uh, enabled me to give great feedback to my engineer and then him do the actual mechanics of setting up the car. Um, so yeah, Pikes Peak again, not only from um, sponsorship support, um, but from driver skill set has had a huge underpinning of um, how I developed you know, my driving technique and my driving style. Yeah, definitely, definitely smooth. And and Jeff Swart, you know, again, he 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 loves you to death. I think you know that. And and that was one thing he said. He's just incredibly smooth. And Jeff is smooth. So to hear Jeff say that about someone else, you know, it's like okay. And and for me, it was weird because at Pikes Peak, I you know, you look at the list, and I was like, oh my word, there's all these guys I look up to, all these championship guys. And so you try not to be starstruck while you're there. And I'm like. I have a picture Jeff doesn't know about. I saw him in his car when he was going to meet me at the garage and I was ahead of him. I pulled out in front. I could see him. So I pulled out in front of him about a you know quarter of a mile. And I'm like, I was so excited. I got my phone out and I'm taking pictures looking backwards. <laughs> so, I could nice. take pictures. so I could have photo evidence that once in my life I was ahead of him. You're ahead of him. Perfect. Yep. <laughs> um, but the one thing, I'm really curious about, you know, you both have done rally and, you know, again, Reese, some of the videos that are out there are just phenomenal. When you have a navigator, someone in that passenger seat, I don't, I don't know how I would do with that. How do you yeah, explain, it's, walk us through that because there, there's, there's a lot there. Well, so, and, and this is going back to rallying, um, you know, to go fast, you have to know what, you're doing obviously that's a very obvious statement but you have to understand the mechanics of the car and um, going backwards here a little bit um, you know the tires talk to you um, <laughs> the tires talk to you if you're in a production car going around the racetrack and and you have a hint of a squeal uh, that means that your corner entry speed or your mid corner speed or if the squeal stays the same when you start to apply throttle on, on exit on a track, um, you're, you're pretty much maximized the support level of the suspension and the contact patch of the tire. You start to increase that squeal if it's on turning, you've turned in too fast for what that car is capable. And then on corner exit, you've applied the throttle too early for what that tire and that chassis is capable of. So a good foundation of understanding what the vehicle is doing to you, the car will talk to you and the tires are kind of the first obvious. Um, progress on to a full racing slick where maybe they don't make noise and, and you can uh, get yourself in trouble really quick if you fly throttle too fast or whatever. Um, and then again, on the basics of setting up a car, I, I still go back uh, for Pikes Peak specifically, we go down to PPIR um, and on they have a little infield course there. And on the infield of the infield, they actually have a clean area and we set up four or five cones and we create like a 200 foot skid pad. And I took that production Bentley and the guys were engineers were there and I'm like, it, it's got no front support. It's got no, no grip. And they're like, well, these are our dynamic settings, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay, put them at neutral. I'm going to drive around this. I'm going to do a clockwise and a counterclockwise 200 foot oval and if I can't increase the speed any more than this, then you need to make a change. Now these guys are really, really smart, but they need input. So within the rules, I'm not talking outside of the rules here, OEM settings, um, we changed electronic sway bars, um, air pressure on shocks, ride heights, and we got that car to go around that circle about four to five mile an hour faster than what we were from the production settings. Um, put that back up on the mountain the next morning and in our qualifying section, we went from a, I think a 426 to a 418, eight seconds oh, faster, yeah. over a second a mile faster. So it's amazing how the basics, not trying to do a duplicate course layout, just doing a skid pad, the basics are still so important in, in vehicle setup. Uh, and again, you know, listening to what the car is doing, tires and so forth for, for setup. 
cool. Yeah, and so I'm gonna call you the tire whisperer from now on. You know, what was what was your final time? I mean, you shattered the production record. Yeah, uh, Porsche had set the record uh, in what I came to find out was a very highly modified car. Um, or <laughs> At, at a 10.26, and uh, we dropped the record to a 10.18. Um, <clears throat> and that was um, with some weather on the day as well. A uh, yeah. little, little bit. Uh, just enough to be safe. Maybe maybe it was worth a second and a half, but you got to work really hard to find a second and a half out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm, you're talking to a guy that's got to find minutes. So, um, <laughs> But yeah, it's, you know, in that morning, my, one of my favorite videos I have of myself is when you were warming up the car on the jack stands and you were oh, getting yeah. ready and, and I just came up to the car and I took a video of it running and then I just prayed for you in the car without disturbing you but I remember I walked away and I told Mary I said man I just got a really good feeling Reese is going to take care of business today <laughs> and you just had this look on your face like okay I've showed up to work this is yeah. this is going to be it it's cra it's crazy it is the only event and I want I guess you could say I get nervous for it. Um, it's the only event where, you know, let's face it, it's once a year, you've got one run on the day and every braking zone, it's, it's like going to a regular event and qualifying, trying to qualify on pole, but with the pressure of only one lap, really no practice laps outside of what you did three days ago and the road was completely different. It wasn't 20 minutes earlier in a warm up session. Yep. And you've just got to get everything exactly right. Um, it's the only event of the year that I probably pee like five times in the morning and yeah. go for quiet walks, clicking my fingers before I'm ready to hop in the car. Don't Peeing five times thing. loses a lot of weight, by the way. That's why I do it. Oh, is that what it is? <laughs> no, no. Not when I was running a 4,800-pound production car. <laughs> oh, man. It doesn't matter, does it? You could have put a 12-pack in the back. You have been fine. Yeah, it was that heavy. How yeah, many pounds was well, it? The SUV was uh, 4,990, 4,980. And I think the production car was like 4,280 or something like that. I don't want to tell you how heavy Bernice was. You'd think I was a liar. Big girl. Oh, Bernice was heavy. She was 3,800, I think. What? We had, you know, we were so worried about cooling and everything. So we had double okay. cooling. So you're talking all these hoses and everything where this year, you know, we're going 80s, the intercoolers in the back window. Yeah. A lot less tubing. I, I think we've dumped like 400 and some odd pounds out of her already, just in hoses. Nice. Nice. You were going to say something, Tanner. Sorry. No, that's good. I was just going to ask. Um, so like earlier, Don mentioned something about uh, navigating and rally and whatnot. And Don and I were talking about this a little earlier. I would imagine that the hardest part about that race is probably just memorizing the track uh, and, and having, because I'm not a racer by any means. So I don't, I don't know, but this is just kind of what makes sense in my brain is you have to have almost like a systematic, like, uh, alg algorithm. Don, help me with this word again. A logarithm. Al algorithm. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, approach to the, to the mountain. Right. I mean, as far as how hard you're hitting the gas, when to slow down, how, how to make the turn and then when to accelerate and whatnot. Am I right? Or am I wrong? Like, yeah, no, you're, you're totally right. And, um, you know, again, that was uh, rallying taught me a lot. So yeah. in my early years of rallying, starting in 1992, um, every rally in the U.S. was what they would refer to as uh, blind or green. You had two lip notes, which told you where to go at a junction or maybe a safety if there was a, a concrete bridge or something like that. But uh, not to the description of what world rally notes are with labeling every corner, every straightaway, having a plus or minus on that corner for speed um, or cuts, don't cuts, whatever it is. So um, you, you had to, in US rallying, they, your navigator might sit there and go, okay, this is a 15 mile stage. Um, I have no information for 3.5 miles. 
So 3.5 miles, you're on your own. And yeah. you, just rock, you just rocked up to the stage, um, full gravel, might be raining, might be muddy, uh, and you've never seen this road before. With, with so, nothing to anticipate. Nothing at all. You might come yeah. around the first corner, which has happened, um, and you're off the road because you yeah. went too quick or whatever it was. Or it might change from gravel to uh, big trees on that corner and a lot of leaves across the road, and all of a sudden the grip went away 60%, 80%. Yeah. So you had to absorb your surroundings. And this is where my father was instrumental in, in my career from uh, he didn't have the one on one time because he was still active in, in his own career, um, but was able to to help me with um, all of his verbal experience to apply to Pikes Peak and, and to rallying. And that came in the form of reading the road. Yeah. Um, bringing out natural characteristics of your surroundings that enabled you to paint a visual picture of what the road is doing in front of you. Um, and, you know, both of you guys right now, if, if you're going down a forest road or, or a wooded area, um, and if you are going up and over a crest of a road that you're not familiar with, if you look at the trees on each side, if the tree line, the sky at the top of the trees, is enables you to see far further over that crest than you can see. Uh, if that tree line stays straight, you know that road is straight. If that tree line starts to curve to the right or left, then it's a good indicator of where the road is going to go. Um, another one to kind of visualize, if you're on the side of a mountain, um, let's say um, the cliff is on your right and the mountain vertical side is on your left, water is going to drain down the down the mountain through a valley. So in this case, if your your left corners are going to tighten at the end, and then your right in the valley of, of the drainage of the mountain is going to be very tight. So you can pretty much predict what the characteristic of the road is going to be, knowing that there's a cliff on your right, reverse that if the cliff is on your left. So you're absorbing as much as you can. And, and Pikes Peak has several of these characteristics to, to just en enable you to remind yourself where you are on the road um, or give you visual cues to, so you know where you're on the road, when you're learning the road. Yeah. In Baja racing, this might be for a thousand miles. Um, and to have this sort of instinctual knowledge is, is huge just as a, a way to maintain speed without taking risk. And how much does that vary from, from forest to mountain to desert? You know, do you find uh, those similar characteristics? Desert is probably the hardest one because you deal with um, a, a lot of uh, like flash flood sort of runoffs. Yeah. That the road looks like it's going straight um, and it's being washed away <laughs> and you don't want to make that mistake. Um, so, yeah, elements of the desert can be very, very tricky. Um, but, but for the most part, when you're up in the mountains, when you're in the forests and so forth, there's, there's just several. Once you build that foundation of knowledge, um, there is so much speed to, to come along with it. Yeah, that's cool. I, so I was a, a musician uh, prior to my position with Don. Um, toured in a band for about 12 years. And I can tell you right now that there is no way that I would have stepped on stage without being prepared, without knowing what we were going to do. Yeah. You know, so like it takes balls, you know, it's, that's some guts, you know, like going into an event thinking, I'm just going to hurl this vehicle as fast as I can in this direction, not knowing what's up ahead, you know? So. Right. Right. The, the value, the value, um, again, from, spending most of my career on a loose surface, uh, dirt, um, is there's so much, so much more attention that needs to be paid to the surface of the road um, yeah. to give you warning signs or to give you information that there is grip or isn't grip. Um, pavement racing masks a lot of that. Um, there's kind of grip everywhere um, until it's raining, but rain is a good indicator that there's no grip. So. You're, you're constantly analyzing the surface and then looking as far forward as you can to, to get, you know, speed of what's coming up. And then 
looking at your horizon lines to just kind of place you where you are. Um, in rallying and in off-road racing, you know, the color of the surface tells you a lot. If it's, if it's a lighter color, um, it typically means it's a crushed granite or it's a sand. Um, it's going to be softer or slipperier. Mm -hmm. If it's a darker color, it means that it's more compact dirt or maybe a wetter base and there's going to be more grip. So just understanding a couple of those nuances um, just allows you just to adapt the way that you drive the car, either with throttle or with brake. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and and so you were you were hitting on uh, knowing terrain and and everything else, Reese. But let's let's talk about our project together. Yes. <laughs> so number one is you've also done Baja. So, you know, we, we haven't talked about that. So let's talk about that. You've done Baja, you've done Nora, um, you've done some of the American side score as well, correct? Um, and so are you like me? If it's got wheels, you'll race it? Yeah, pr pretty much. I've, I've pitched TV shows about wanting to go around the whole of the United States and be like Joe's versus pros and just show up kind of like that undercover boss that you would, you know, not, not that everyone knows who I am, but you would just go uh, lawnmower racing or, you know, barstool racing or dirt tracking or swamp buggy or whatever. So I'm still trying to pitch that show to Motor Trend, but well, I think it'd it, be pretty cool you, just to show up everywhere, you know, rent a ride or buy a ride, build it, and then just go race the locals. Because let's face it, the locals will smoke me because they have so much knowledge of the course, but it'd be fun to do. Well, if, if you ever want to do dirt or asphalt oval, I've got a few. So yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. Yes, I'll up. race anything. Yeah, and and so, um, when was the first year you you went out and did some desert racing? Uh, two thousand and six. <clears throat> was it really that late? Yeah, it was like two thousand and four, two thousand and six. Um, was my first Baja years, five hundred and thousand, and then we stepped out of it uh, mexico got a little sketchy and um and then we had other programs that were keeping us very active uh in the later years with hyundai we were running two or three programs we had um rally cross drift and pike speed so between building the vehicles and, and racing events um, we were we were really busy so we stepped out of the off-road side of things but still had a deep passion for it um, and felt that there was some unfinished business from what we were familiar with, with rally cars. Um, and where the trend of building tanks for off-road racing had, had gone. Um, so we hopped back into it in 2014, I think it was. Um, playing around with the UTV market, which is an amazing sort of platform for people to get their feet wet. Um, maybe other parts of their bodies wet too if, if they don't keep it on their tires. Um, um. And <laughs> shots fired, um, shots fired. <laughs> um, and, and then developed the car that we had kind of always had uh, in mind and uh, had a very successful first couple of showings and, and it developed it even further. Um, we'll be racing here in about three weeks for in Nevada for the Silver State 300 event. I'm jealous. Um, yeah, so, you know, the one thing, Reese, that I liked, you know, obviously we had a lot of conversations before I pulled the trigger on our project, you know, and uh, the biggest thing is you've got a whole different approach to the whole Baja buggy slash truck and how they're built. And I think... I'm, I'm an engineer by trade. I don't know if you knew that. And it spoke to my engineering mind. <clears throat> and so Andy is the same way, right? So when Andy and I talked about it, I'm like, you know, he kind of asked me, what did you find for trucks? You know, I said, this is, this is what I'm looking at. But I said, you know, I asked Jeff Sward, I said, you know, Baja, he says, oh, Reese would be who I'd build a truck. You know, he'd, he'd be the way to go. And after talking to you about just the approach you guys took, it's kind of like, I like this. And it makes it a lot more affordable. I mean, let's face it. Uh, you're beating, you're beating vehicles that are four, five, six times the cost of what you build a truck for, or a buggy, and yep. uh, you're making them look like chumps, <laughs> and so, uh, hence why we're at. So, you know, for me, 
Baja, Nora, you know, even the even the silver and some of the others are all things on our list. Um, for me, it was picking number one is, you know, you let me pray with you. That was that was a big selling point for me too. But you know, obviously just your pedigree. And then I, I like a grassroots guy. I like a guy that that came up, had talent, worked through it, and then the approach you took with your with your buggy. Explain to me. When did you realize like, yeah, I know how I'm going to build this now? Because it kind of seemed like, like you said, you were doing your homework and all of a sudden, boom, here you go. You got, you got the jackal. I mean, when did you uh, know that you kind of felt like, okay, we've got the package I want. Let's put it together. Yeah. So, it, you know, if you look at through everything we did in motorsport, um, it was, you know, it was a, a cooking cauldron of two pieces, of this five pieces of that sort of thing to, to get the recipe right. And, and, um, in, in drift, we uh, drifting is one of the most top level um, performances required from a talented driver. To to stick that vehicle inch perfect on the wall every time is it, it's one of the highest levels of driving I've ever done, and commitment I should say. Um, but you know, you set the car up right, like anything, and and you've got the right tools, you've got the right steering angle, so you're not going to spin. You've got the side grip. Um, and you've got the power and, and you can raise your ability far further than if you don't understand some of these foundation points. Uh, we looked at drifting and, and looked at it. We were the first ones to put a V8 into drifting. We understood that torque driving off the bottom of the RPM was very important. Um, back then it was all four cylinder turbocharged cars, um, kind of influence from the Japanese market. Uh, everyone was using, um, shoe style drum brakes, disc brakes. Um, for handbrakes, we introduced hydraulic handbrake from the rallying world. And then we looked at it and we're like, okay, so you're trying to slide around the corner for speed. Well, if you take a, a big sprint car with the big wings on the top, that's putting aero force against the slip angle of the car um, with a taller sidewall tire to, to let the sidewall flex, keep the contact patch on the ground, and try to slide through the corner as fast as we can. So we built perspex um, fins that came off the roof to the back of the trunk, uh, and I could throw that car sideways, and anyone that tried to follow me in that deep, they were just sliding off the course. They weren't even making the corner. So it was surrounding yourself with you know, the, the best of everything to, to be able to perform. Um, we went into the off-road world, and and don't get me wrong, the, Modern trophy trucks are absolutely phenomenal, but you're going to pay six, seven hundred thousand dollars to a million dollars for a vehicle and expect to do a hundred thousand dollar prep every time you take it out. Um, this I could not justify personally, um, and I couldn't justify it as a as a customer model for a car as well. Um, but we felt that four wheel drive was of utmost importance because why would you want to go put 600 horsepower through two tires on loose surface when 450 horsepower with four wheel drive um, would get you the twice the result. Uh, we looked at the engines from small displacement turbocharged vehicles from our background in rally. And we looked at the transmissions of what was available also from rally and kind of formulated a car that was um, just on a different scale. Um, but if you scaled the numbers, it would equal to, to what the trophy trucks are. So, you know, trophy trucks are six to 7,000 pounds. Um, per wheel and tire weighs 140 pounds. We're 3,000 pounds and per tire weighs 70 pounds. Um, but if you take the road racing side of things for unsprung weight and mass, um, everything is in our favor. Braking on loose surface, corner speed, and corner exit with four-wheel drive. Um, the only thing we give up is going through the big, big bumps um, at 100 plus miles an hour where, where they are built like tanks and they can take that. Um, but in a thousand mile race, when that's only 10%, um, I will take a fuel mileage of six and a half to seven miles to the gallon versus uh, 1.8 miles to the gallon. Wow. So it's a different mindset, but it's a mindset from all of our past experiences um, and the opportunity to prove people wrong. Um, 
we have, again, a lightweight wheel and tire. So when I get a flat, as an old guy, I quite happily uh, will load a 70 pound wheel and tire versus 150 pound wheel and tire. Um, and the car works incredibly well. And when you come, you, you set yourself at the start line, um, your mindset, and this is no different than Pikes Peak. Um, race day at Pikes Peak, if you've done a, a great week, um, you're comfortable, you're calm, you're focused, you're gonna have a good run. If you've had a struggle of a week, um, you're gonna struggle on race day. You're gonna try to compensate for things as a driver. You're not gonna be focused and you're gonna make mistakes or overdrive and, and potentially make a big mistake. Um, you go to sleep racing off-road racing as the Baja or any of these other races and you've just walked out of a, a driver's meeting and they said at race mile 380, there's the worst silt beds that we've ever seen in 15 years of being down here prepared to get stuck. Well, you go to bed the night before because you're driving one of our cars and you've got four wheel drive. There's, there's absolutely nothing you can't get through. And was the case two years ago, race mile 380, 35 to 40 of the cars got stuck, never got out. Some took two days to get out because their mm -hmm. chase crews couldn't even get in there and get them. Uh, with four wheel drive, we just picked our way through all the headlights in the middle of the night. The headlights were up at the sky. They were down at the ground. They were on the sky. They were upside down. And we just drove around everyone. Um, started, uh, we were running a UTV then. Um, we started uh, like 200th vehicle up the line and I think we finished 24th overall. So that kind of set the tone for developing the new car um, using that sort of same mindset. We built a four wheel drive car, 450 sort of horsepower, 450 torque sequential six-speed gearbox, long trailing links, um, so it works through the bumps very well. Um, amazing brakes off a WRC car um, and a lightweight wheel and tire package. So, so now you have a great foundation that um, you, know, you can be focused, you can be calm, and, and you can just you know, drive the event without having to take so many risks. The trucks, with two wheel drive have to come into the corners and keep as much roll speed up as they can, pounding through berms, running off the roads, um, because if they slow down too much, they're gonna get stuck. So see, we got the best best builder building us the best truck. <laughs> so we build a pretty cool vehicle, yes. You do. So, I I love the look of it. So if you drop the tire size down and and the weight and whatnot, does that caught like do you find that you have like more flats or more more damage to the tire because of no that? because yeah no it's actually great questions and um they can easily be asked because um physics play into flats most flats come from a pinch flat yep. that is the compression weight of the chassis onto the tire will drive the tire into the ground or a rock and yep. and the rim will hit the rock and and Break basically call, call, cause a pinch flat or a seal yeah. Um, when you don't have the chassis weight compressing the tire, um, you're reducing that factor. Um, we are slightly smaller on tire diameter. Most of the big trucks are around 39s. We're, we're 37s. Um, still but a what, massive tire. But, but it's still a very tall tire. So, so mm -hmm. what we did is they're around uh, 13 inches wide, their rear tires, 12 and a half to 13 inches wide but you only have two drop tires driving that ratio. So if you're 13 inches, you've got 26 inches of rubber on the ground pushing forward a 6,000 pound car. Well, we knew that we were going four wheel drive, so we worked with a tire manufacturer to design a tire that's only nine inches wide. But you have four tires driving the car forward. So we're actually 36 inches of driving force, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So we're, we're still, you know, a, a solid 50% more than what they are, but every tire is driving with an adequate amount of horsepower to whereas you're not just spinning the tires. Mm -hmm. So it enabled the tire to drop, although our diameter is still big, drop to 50% per corner. So they also, from the fact that you just brought up, being so heavy, sometimes if it, they hit that rock, they will double flat. So the front will go flat and the rear on the same side will go flat. So they have to carry two tires in the basket. We only carry 
one in the basket. So take 70 pounds a corner and times it by five, and we're that much lighter just on wheels and tires. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, now take fuel, and they are 1.8 miles to the gallon. Well, they're carrying 90 to 100 gallons of fuel to go the same range that we're carrying 35 to 40 gallons of fuel. So they're <laughs> then another three to 400 pounds. So nearly 800 pounds just in fuel and tires that they have to carry. And you said this discovery was within the last couple of years, correct? Yeah, I've always wanted to build a vehicle. Um, our last couple of years of Rallycross, we used a transmission that is um, developed from a company in France that specializes in Dakar vehicles. Um, so we were exposed to that transmission in Rallycross and, and we found that it was very, very strong. Um, a transaxle design, so it, it drove off the back of the engine for a mid to rear engine vehicle. Um, and it had a, a power takeoff unit that sent drive to the front, to the front differential. Um, mm -hmm. There's nothing like that available in the US. So this was kind of a, a spearhead element that we had over the rest of the designers and builders that are in the industry. Yeah. Plus, no one that the US market and this is a face palm, but because I'm doing it right now, um, it's all about V8s. You got to have a V8 to go fast. Well, I'm sorry, but we we beat three quarters of the field our first time out with a, a four cylinder engine with half the horsepower. So you don't need a V8, but now I'm actually going to put a V8 in a car because, well, it's going to sell cars to those people that are still believers. <laughs> but we're building a, probably the best compromise and package led by. Um, Don's influence here is uh, we're using a 2.7 liter Ford EcoBoost uh, compact 60 degree V6 um, with little turbos that will be so drivable, so manageable, um, probably even better gas mileage than what we're currently getting on the four cylinder. Yeah, I, I <clears throat> as you know, Tanner, my robots built the cam covers on the EcoBoost, so. Yeah, and um, so I kept pushing Reese, and he he kept looking into it, and they found a way to do it, and so I'm I'm excited to have it. I I love the drivability of of both the small and the big V6, and we just didn't need it, so the small one fits in there well. We didn't compromise on fuel, which was awesome. Um, but man, as you can see, you know it's funny you talk about the WRC brakes. The last WRC I was in was a 2015, no, 2019, and it was 4,100 pounds. Okay. Yeah. I couldn't believe that. And yeah. I'm sitting there thinking like, you put that, those brakes are used to stopping something that's two to 300 pounds heavier. Yeah, no, no wonder. And they're great brakes. I mean, the WRC is a great handling car. I see why people like it. It stays planted. It travels well. I never knew they were that heavy. That blew yeah, my mind. Yep. Yeah. And so good breaks, but I'm 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 excited for it. Now, Reese, your year has not gone as planned as as a lot of us. Um, I was looking forward to a showdown between you and Jeff. And I I hear that that's gonna be postponed for a year on your side. Um, yeah, ho hopefully just a year. Yes. Yeah, that's that's the hope, and and so there's no chance of you bringing an alternative car this year, huh? Uh, the the hardest thing this year with um, COVID around is, um, you know, I make my income from the film industry, doing stunt driving, and uh, as of March, um, I haven't been working. <laughs> so you know, um, fingers crossed. Not not this finger because I just about blew this one off last year. Um, <laughs> But fingers crossed the industry gets back to normal and, um, and we're out working while you guys are playing on the side of a mountain. Well, I'm, I'm, I'll be thinking of you. And again, I'm going to try suckering you to come out second tire test weekend <laughs> and coach. Yeah, for sure. No, that would be, that would be fun. It, you know, Pikes, I, I, I love the event. Um, it was a huge disappointment to get the phone call from um, Bentley. Um, yeah. We, we had uh, developed quite a weapon of a car and and it was kind of their way of paying me back as a thank you for two years of sticking with production vehicles um and it was going to be super super fun but uh as as they signed off they said the program's not dead we're just postponing it a year so good 
Good. Yeah, I was bummed, especially when you told me what you had planned. So, but uh, we'll be, we're going to continue to pray that next year goes well. I do have to ask, Reese, I remember when you had that, you posted your finger uh, online. Yeah. Horrific. Um, horrific. I never did ask. I just remember sending you a message and letting you know I was pr praying for you. And, and I, you were on my prayer wall every morning for four months straight because I was like, man, that's, a, that's one of your money makers. <laughs> um, yes. How yeah. did it, I never asked, do you mind sharing? How did it happen? I don't, I never, I never did ask you. Yeah. So um, for, for years, um, I have, this kind of goes back to, you as an engineer, my, my engineering, um, and first point of contact as a driver, um, you know, you sit in the seat and you touch the wheels and you touch the pedals, but part of the car that touches the ground is the tire. Um, and it's the most important thing I feel as a driver is understanding what support is there from the tire or, or, or what the tire is going to do for you, both in compound and construction, uh, and in tread design, because most of the time we're, driving on something other than just a full slick. Right. So I mount all of our wheels and tires here at the shop for every oh, wow. event. Um, it's a little bit of a fitness thing to keep the guns up. <laughs> um, boy. And, and it enables me to, to feel the, the strength of the sidewall. Um, and when I seat the tire, um, I can understand what air pressure that particular tire beads up and seats on that particular rim. So when I'm driving it, I know what it's going to take to knock it off. So it's, it's again, it's those basics of driving that, that they're there. It's just the way you think about it all. Um, so I learned in my early rally years, and maybe this is by mistake, um, but we didn't have a tire sponsor. So I was kind of collecting tires and I had a mixture of Pirelli and, Yokohama and Michelin rally tires um, and I would mount them all and I would mount the Michelins and and bang they would go on at about 80 psi that that is normal for a rally tire on a rally rim the bead is is so so tight um, and then I would mount a Pirelli and I'd be like wow at like 50 psi or 45 psi this went went on and I'd put my knee into the carcass of the tire before I mounted it and I'm like the sidewalls are really soft on this Pirelli. So I, I quickly learned, okay, if I'm on a sandy stage um, where there might be a lot of ruts, I, I want sidewall support and the tire that's not going to knock off, so Michelin would be better. But if I'm on a hard-based gravel road where I want kind of that flex out of that sidewall and a sideways flex, kind of like a drag race tire wrinkling to go forward, but in a sideways fashion, then I want that, that softer sidewall from that Pirelli. Um, so every time we've built a new car, I have always mounted the wheels and tires. Well, in designing the new car, uh, unfortunately the, the tolerances of the tire, um, were too tight for the rim that I was familiar with and, um, and it, it blew up on me, um, yeah. at about Whoa. 50, 50 PSI, which is again, not, not crazy. Um, but surface but area. Surface area and pressure. Oh, Oof. per square inch, it's a lot yeah. of force, and it it was uh, just a, a unforeseen calculation error on the engineering side of the tire and wheel combination, and it may be a, a mistake on our behalf. Our well, not really. The the valve stem is very very shallow, and you can't put a regular tire seal on it. So you actually had to. I would have to hold the chuck over top of the um, valve stem. So when the beadlock ring blew off, it basically blew my whole hand off with it. Whoa. Um, well, which, yeah, which, you know, was July 19th, um, month, month after Pike's Peak, and it took yep. me out for four months. Um, thankfully, the doctors were able to re repair my hand as best as they could. Um, I still have, it broke across, the palm and broke my pinky knuckle, degloved and shattered the bone to where it wasn't even there in my middle finger and, and really damaged every other hand uh, finger. So I have 50% of the grip strength. I can't close my hand up any more than this. And my middle finger is 
it's on a splint that it's pretty much stuck at 90 degrees. So mm. out of that, you always look at the positives. I've got a hand. I can still ride a bike. Um, I can still hug my daughter. Yeah. And, um, and we've just 3D printed everything for the shifters and the steering wheels to, to keep my grip pressure up. But now my thumbs and my fingers from 3D printing the steering wheel to a two and a quarter inch, not a one inch, uh, are not inside the steering wheel. So I don't have any issues with breaking thumbs or breaking ah, fingers. Up. Yeah, so, that's a good point. So I'm talking with Sparco right now to actually design a new steering wheel specifically for off-road racing. So we look at the positives. I'm still very thankful that I, I have my hand um, and still able to do what I, I love, which is ride bikes and drive cars. Yeah, and Reese, I won't lie to you, man. After hearing that, I'm just glad you're here. Uh, you know, it's... I've, uh, <laughs> it was two seconds away from probably taking my face off because I look, I bent down on the underside of the machine to look up to understand why it hadn't, the tire hadn't seated at 50 PSI. And that's when it was just an almighty kaboom and parts of my hand were everywhere. And I was running through the shop holding what you saw. Uh, and I don't do too good with blood. So I just ran and lay down in the middle of the shop and put my hand up in the air. And my lead engineer ran out and grab my hand like a tourniquet um but uh yeah yeah thank thankful that my face wasn't over top of it because you're probably right about two seconds before that yeah i've uh i've witnessed a bad tire seating accident once in my life when i was younger and uh, that didn't end well so I'm, I'm glad that things worked out you still have a hand um i have a feeling that it's it's not going to matter a bit in your driving career i know you may feel different but I don't know. I've watched enough videos of you. I don't see it. And I saw you on your mountain bike. I saw that video. You're like, oh, de-stressing. And I'm like, I, yeah. I, <clears throat> I've got a really weird oval grip that we slid on the handlebar and we have a foam over top of that um, just to get grip pressure. Um, as yeah. I mentioned, the race car and all of that is the same way. It, 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 it was weird. I, I went back into stunts. Um, a few months after the incident and and I actually struggled I had no arm strength um, my wrist was heavily damaged as well and I couldn't articulate my wrist in the way that I needed um, to, to perform and it, and it was a little bit of a, a mental challenge more than anything um, knowing if, if, if I could perform to the level that I, I knew I could um, and uh, you know it's been gosh nine months now and it's still not right but it gets stronger and stronger every week and with my middle finger bent um i have to kind of hook to everything yeah, yeah. so yeah. where you used to go from steering wheel to shifter i got to kind of come around the back side now um because this finger is just yeah a little little thicker than the rest yeah <laughs> and it's a struggle to get your keys out of your pocket as well but <laughs> uh, yeah <I'm> gonna... <laughs> And you can't tell anybody they're number one. No, no, there's no chance there's, doing that. No. <laughs> it's just kind of like hang loose or whatever. Yeah. It is. yeah. I lost so, I lost this thumb. Nothing like yours, Reese. Uh, and if this gives you some encouragement, this was gone. Um, and I I can't I think it was about two years, but it's yeah. back. I mean, I got the strength back um, in it and nothing like yours, but they're, you know, being patient with it is the big thing. I think that was the hardest thing for me was building back that strength because it just doesn't, people don't understand, but when this is hurting or this is hurting, all of these suffer. And when oh, this everything. suffers, this suffers, when this suffers, this suffers. Yep. And so yeah, it, it, it's tough. It, it, it really is. You did right. The tendons through that middle finger, you know, everything connects to your elbow and it, it, kind of pulls everything tight. So I constantly have these little finger stretches that I'm trying to stretch everything out. Um, but, but as you said, I, I, I look for the good in things and, um, and more than anything, it's actually slowed me down. Um, and where maybe I would rush some projects. Um, now I'm forced to take my time. Uh, and that's had an influence on, on everything that I do. So, from this came projects that were sitting at home idle and things that I hadn't done with my family for 10 years that are now completed and, and are actively happening. So yeah, got to look at the good. That is good. And you got all your uh, raised garden beds in. 
got my garden beds in, got my pool heaters going on. I don't know about you guys, but we have solar panels to heat the pool, like water, solar water radiators. Yeah. Um, and then I've just been, I've been building a, yeah, a new courtyard and laying tile and stuff that I've always wanted to do. And now this forced time um, that we're experiencing has kind of allowed me to do it. So it's, yeah. it's fun. I actually just bought a house uh, last week, was it? And uh, yeah, so my wife and I are kind of knee deep in the middle of renovating an old home from the 70s. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Congrats on that. Thank you. I'm just getting in trouble. <laughs> no, I'm excited about it, Reese. Again, I see we went way past the time I told you would be. It is so cool oh. to learn more about you. Hey, before we leave, what? tell us about everything you build at um, RMR. I want people to know what they can go to you for. You know, Andy and I are talking about a monster truck one day, so we may talk to you about that. But um, I don't think but, we have tools big enough to work on those. <laughs> so we're he's thinking, well, maybe if we built part of it and Reese built part of it. Well, but anyways, what 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 can you all do for 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 those gearheads out there? You've got a lot going on there. Yeah. So we um, service obviously the motorsport industry. Um, and in the film industry as well. Um, starting with the film industry, we built a lot of vehicles um, for different installments of TV shows, um, TV commercials, and, and box office, you know, big screen. Um, Land Rovers, yeah, totally. things like that. Yeah. yeah go on yeah. the moon. Yeah, we, for uh, last year's um, September installment, um, Brad Pitt as the A-list actor for Ed Astra. Yep. Uh, we built the Moon Rovers for that. Um, for Jumanji, it was cool. released in December, uh, the new one. Uh, we built the all the Razor-based buggies for that. Um, we've done TV shows for Disney building cars. Um, for Fast and the Furious installments, three, four, and seven. Um, we built uh, a lot of the cars that did the drift scenes um, uh, from rear wheel drive cars to four wheel drive Subarus in the snow and ice. And so lots of movie cars and bits and pieces. And then obviously as an extension of our own motorsport efforts, uh, everything was kind of designed and developed um, from the street car side of things. Uh, we have a composite division. We have uh, fabrication and machine division. Um, we, we offered everything that we designed for uh, partners with uh, Pontiac, with the GTO, um, with uh, Mitsubishi, with Hyundai, um, and Toyota. We designed and developed a full line of products to support those interests that we were out marketing those vehicles and racing. And then in recent terms with what we're doing with the Polaris brand uh, and Can-Am brands and the UTV side of things, um, and, and build in logistics for off-road racing, which has kind of turned into our, our focus currently. So um, from turnkey race cars, tubular design, composite bodies to logistics support um, at race events um, to driver training, we do it all. Yeah, and uh, I'm thankful you do. <laughs> I'm looking uh, forward we're gonna, to it. We're gonna have a lot of fun. This is, it's, it's gonna be an eye opener. Um, it, I have no clue what I'm getting myself into, do I? None. Which is fantastic because the smiles and the impressions are going to be 10 times as big. Um, All right. It, it, is, it is kind of like uh, Mad Max meets the Thunderdome sort of thing. It's, it's just, you, you're, it's like the Wild West down in Mexico. Obviously, you know, we're very respective of the land that we're driving on because most of it is private and we're given small access windows to race on, on these farmers properties or through their properties. Um, and we're very respectable of um, other situations that potentially could be around, but we don't really venture into those areas. Uh, mm -hmm. You're smart, you're calculated. Um, we have a lot of very good testing um, and recce. So we have great safety notes. Um, and we go down and have tacos and have a fun time. That's my kind of time. Tacos. Now yep. I'm looking forward to it, Reese. And again, I know you're super busy, man. And I, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time with me today and Tanner. 
and uh, telling us so much about your life. An interesting man. Um, you know, you're kind of like the Dos Equis guy. <laughs> the most interesting man. You, like I said, you and Jeff Swart, I, I would love to sometimes sit down, campfire, the three of us, and just hear some more stories yeah. from you guys. That, so. 1993, I was, I was crewing for Jeff, driving his race transport around the U.S. Are you serious? Wow. Yep. Before, before I, I, I had done a couple of races myself. It rolled my car and had no money, so I parked it for 18 months, and I went and worked for him to pay for it, to repair it. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Hey, uh, I know you got to go. Two things really quick I just want your opinion on. One is, can the overall Pikes Peak record be beat with an internal combustion engine? Yes or no? no I don't think so. No? So, you know, the year that Sebastian Loeb set the record and um, beat my 2012 run with a incredible program and an amazing vehicle and an amazing driver. Um, we got within one second of Loeb's time on every section, um, bar the bottom section where, so one second on the top, one second in the middle, slower than him. Um, and I think like six or eight seconds on the bottom. Um, the car had no aero, had no real development, but the burst speed was absolutely phenomenal from four wheel drive, um, big tires, uh, and just talk like you've never experienced before in your life. Um, at that point, I was convinced an EV vehicle was going to be the vehicle to, to set the old time new record. And, and two years later, you, you experienced that. You know, our, our, we're looking at some EV options as well as hybrid. Um, and for me, obviously this year, I want to make it up to the top. I want to make race day and make yeah. it up the top. So I'm worrying about this year, but you know, as an engineer, I'm always thinking, right. And, and Andy's kind of the same way. We, we just always think about the future and, and what people will be bringing. And, and we're just, you know, we just worry about ourselves but when we think about what's, what's the future going to bring for that Hill. Right. To totally. Um, you know, I was, like I said, I was there the year that um, Sebastian Loeb set the record. I finished second to him that year. Um, and uh, yeah, he straight up said to me, it's the scariest race he's ever done in his life. Um, wow. Yeah, straight up the scariest race he's ever done in his life. And, and if he doesn't have to come back, he doesn't want to come back. Um, you know, the, the road has so many elements um, that, that are, are very, very dangerous, um, but very re rewarding when you get them right. Um, and just that element of, having two days off and the weather patterns that typically roll in, it just leads a lot, a lot of questioning and unanswered um, questions until you're experiencing it for the one and only time of that one run through every corner. So it, it's a different level of pressure than any other form of motorsport. Um, and you're, you're dead right. Hybrids or electrics, I feel, are, are the only way that are going to, compete for that record but there are still there's diesel records there's so many other records yeah, yeah. or even EV, ev um records and production cars that still can be you know achieved yeah my dream would be to take either like the new nicola that's coming out or the rivian or even fords yep. I, I would love so if they're watching this by some weird chance you send me an ev i'll send it up pike's peak yeah well it, what's the the new Ford Mustang. Yeah. That would be that would perfect. Be. I'm a Ford nut. So I, I would have thought. Yeah. I think Tesla has the fastest EV production car right now. And it wasn't a very impressive time. The team didn't do their homework. And they had overheating problems and, and all sorts. Um, well, rumor had it they just left it at the charging station when they were done with it. I, I actually did see those pictures as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it was, and finally, finally, the yeah, we left it there. And so, um, interesting. It, I'll tell you what, Pike's Peak, the one thing that everybody told me that I always held on in my head is respect it, respect it, respect it. And you talk about it changing. Like, I seriously felt like it changed from one run to the next, especially on the upper section when we were up there. And, and the W is by far my favorite area. I love, I don't know why. I know everybody pulls yep. their hair out on the W's, but they were like, if, if it was nothing but W's, I'd be okay with it. <laughs> I love that yeah, section. Yeah, yeah. 
as, and, and as we were talking earlier with Tanner about reading roads and, and placing yourself so you know where you are, there's, if, if Jeff hasn't shared with you, I'd be quite happy to share with you, you know, just so you know where you are. No, I, I, I look forward to those times. Jeff shared a ton with me. I've got like five hours of footage and no one will ever see it. It's just awesome. the way it is. So um, yeah. again, Reese, thank okay, you so God. much. God bless yeah. you, man. Have a good day. Hey, it's nice Thanks, meeting Tanner. you. You too. Enjoy the remodel on the house. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Take care, you guys. Nice. See ya.